I'm Dan Edmonds, and this is a new Ford Ranger Raptor. I don't know about you, but I've been waiting for this one for a long time because the last generation Ranger, there was a Raptor, but it was only sold in Australia and other world markets. We didn't get it in the United States. But with this new reformulated Ranger, we do get a Raptor, and this is it. So what I'm gonna do is pull the wheels and tires off, have a look at the suspension, and then drive it up my ramp to see how well that suspension articulates. You won't want to miss it. So this is the Ranger Raptor's new front suspension. And as you can see, it's got an aluminum upper and lower control arm. So this is dual control arm, double wishbone, front suspension. Now the knuckle here is steel. And so that's uh, pretty beefy. It is not a high mount upper arm as we've seen in some cases because this ball joint isn't above the tire. The tire's kind of here, it's kind of behind it. So it's like, a mid-mount upper arm, so they get some of the benefits of the extra leverage, but not all of them. So, interesting choice. Probably has to do with fender packaging, uh, all kinds of things. But uh, anyway, pretty impressive looking. And then this bolt here is the linkage to the stabilizer bar. So this has a direct-acting stabilizer bar with a one-to-one -one motion ratio. So that means a smaller bar will do more work than you think it can because it's gonna move one-to-one -one with the wheel and the hub. Now here, of course, that is the coilover Fox live valve shock. It's a 2.5 inch diameter body. The live valve is uh, adaptive damping on the compression side. Rebound damping is fixed. Uh, Fox has a dual live valve shock, but this isn't that. That's just starting to show up on the F-150 Raptor R for 2024. It hasn't been used up till then, but it's not here. This is the compression only live valve shock. As I said, this ball joint isn't really high enough that it's above the tire to be a true high mount upper arm. It's somewhere in the middle, but I think we're seeing why that is right now. This is pretty far back. They're trying to get a lot of caster angle here. And if this was higher for a given ball joint position, the caster angle would be smaller. So I think what we're seeing is a desire to have a certain amount of caster and the high mount upper arm may not have allowed that. What we're also seeing here is anti-dive geometry in the upper arm. You know, this slope here indicates that that's what's going on. It's not as pronounced as we've seen in some cases, but still the rear mounting point is lower than the front and that creates a resistance to dive under braking. This linkage attached to the upper arm here and this sensor down here relays the suspension movement and position to the vehicle dynamics module that feeds into the Fox live valve adaptive dampers and combines what it measures here with speed, steering angle, throttle position, and the mode switch, like if you're in sport mode or normal or Baja or whatever, the program is different for all those different modes and conditions. A couple of interesting things to note here. One is the knuckle, the steel knuckle is hollow, so it's not nearly as heavy as it looks like it might be, so that's interesting. The other thing we can see is the ball joint down here, a little nub here, and this little piece here hits that at full lock to take the stress off the steering rack so that it'll be a mechanical stop here in the suspension and it won't necessarily put a load on the steering rack at full lock. Of course, the inner pivot is on an eccentric and the same is true of the rear leg. So adjusting camber and caster is a little bit of a back and forth between those two cams, but uh, most alignment technicians are pretty good at that. Of course, the lower end of the coilover bolts right here, big prominent bolt in the middle of the arm. 
pretty close to the ball joint. I'm going to change my view to see if I can guess about the, uh, the motion ratio. This is a good overall view of the lower control arm from the inner pivot to the outer ball joint. And here, the coilover mounting point looks like it's about, I'm going to call it 70% out. Might be a little less, but might be just about that. Of course, the lean angle will deduct a little just because of the lean angle, but it's not going to be a whole lot. Here is the so-called live valve that does the compression adjustment, uh, the compression damping adjustment on these live valve shocks. It's tucked away out of harm's way. I'm not seeing any kind of external bump stop on either of the legs of this lower control arm. So that must mean that it's inside the spring up under the boot near the top of the shock. Let's see if we can find it. Yeah, I'm seeing a hint of the telltale color of urethane up here. And yeah, you can kind of see it when I pull the rubber down. It's there. So uh, yeah, the bump stop works off the top of the shock body and compresses up against the mount. So pretty standard stuff. And it's kind of nice to not have that down by the lower control arm, as long as it's big enough to do the job. How much suspension travel is there here? Well, I was told 10 inches, but I read somewhere else that it was 9.8, which rounds to 10 inches. So take your pick. I'm going to see if I can figure out which one is more correct and put that on the screen. So here's the front stabilizer bar. Obviously, that's the pivot bushing. And here is the lower end of the link. The link attaches to the knuckle here. So again, even though this bar doesn't look very big, it's as efficient as it can be because its linkage is going to move one to one with the wheel. Anytime you have something that's mounted, you know, inside, uh, there isn't as much efficiency, you know, maybe only get 50% twist on the bar. So you have to have a bigger bar to give a, to get a given amount of roll resistance. But here you're going to get everything that this diameter has to offer. And the fact that it's not very big means they're thinking about articulation off road a little bit. You know, you don't want to see a really huge bar in an off-road vehicle. So the calipers here on the Ranger Raptor are two piston sliding calipers. This is the fixed frame and the pins on which the caliper slides. The caliper here, two pistons here. So the pistons squeeze from this side and they pull this side in as they grasp, kind of like your hand does. Of course, the uh, rotors themselves are pretty thick and meaty. Now the stopping distance wasn't great when I tested this, but that's because KO3s are, you know, pretty large lugged off-road tires and stopping distance tests are more about the tires than they are about the brakes. I mean, the fade aspect comes into play here and I didn't see any of that, but the actual stopping distance has a lot more to do with how the tread is designed on the tires and off-road tread just isn't sports car tread. It's not going to stop or grip as well. So that's it for this look at the front suspension of the Ranger Raptor. I'm going to put this big KO3 BF Goodrich all-terrain tire back on here and move to the back. So this is the Ranger Raptor's rear suspension, and it's nothing like a regular Ranger, which has leaf springs back here. Obviously, this doesn't. We have a coilover shock leaning forward. The other one's leaning forward at the same angle because they don't need to be staggered because the axle is located by four trailing links. You can see the lower one here, the shrouded front pivot, and then the rear pivot we'll see from another angle. Uh, the upper link is a little bit hard to see because it's behind the spring on the other side of this frame rail. But a typical thing uh, here, you can see breather tube for the axle. This has, I think it's a 37 inch fording depth and the tires are 33 inch tall. So the top of that tube is going to end in the sides of the bed here somewhere pretty high. But that's not all. The, there's even more back here that's bizarre. Uh, we'll get to the brakes too, but you can pretty much see what they are. 
So yeah, coil over live valve shocks, 2.5 inch diameter, just like the front. Uh, the urethane bump stopper is here inside the dust boot, just like the front. But unlike the front, there is a remote reservoir here for extra oil capacity and better cooling. The live valve uh, is attached here. It's all behind this little plastic guard that protects it from rocks along with this piece here because they didn't invert them. Uh, the heavy stuff is at the bottom, probably just because of packaging space because there's not a lot of room up here with all this gusseting to strengthen the mounting point on the frame. One of the things that I'm a little bit iffy about is the sensor here, which feeds to the vehicle dynamics module and uh, the live valve shocks eventually. I don't know about you, but this looks a little bit vulnerable to trail damage. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they tested it and figured, found that it wasn't, but uh, that's just my first impression. So here is the upper trailing link. We saw the lower one. Pretty obvious, so this is the second link on this side. The other side has two just like it. So those are the four trailing links that position the axle and uh, resist braking and acceleration torque. What we're not seeing is how it's held in place laterally. And that is the weirder part of the story. So this is the weirdness we've been, I've been hinting at. It is not a panhard bar. This is a Watts link, and as you can see, there are two links on either side, and they both connect to this small link, which has a central pivot. And that central pivot is bolted straight into the axle housing. That bolt, the big one there, moves up and down with the axle, and now we have two links that are precisely dimensioned connected to two brackets on either side of the frame so that when this goes up and down, that bolt in the middle goes straight up and down. There's no translation left or right uh, like there can be with a panhard bar. And there's no jacking forces in corners like there can be with a panhard bar, especially if you've lifted it and you get a big angle in it. That's why it's always important to have it as level as possible even after you've put on a lift kit. But this does away with that problem, but it's also, as you can imagine, much more expensive. I mean, we've got to have a much beefier axle. You can see all the truss work on both sides. Of course, the truss work helps for just landing jumps, and uh, there's a lot of nice reasons to have that and aren't part of this, but certainly they all work together here. You can't get to the gears from the back. It's going to have to be the front because all this is sealed up, and I'm not really sure exactly what the consequences are for any lift kits back here. I'll have to reach, research that a little bit more, but certainly there's huge advantages to this. The axle goes straight up and down through its travel. It doesn't translate left or right. Cornering loads are very, very well braced with this setup, and they're symmetrical left and right. Any body roll during cornering does not uh, create any asymmetry like a pan hard rod can do. So, yeah, this is like on paper way better, but in execution, it's more complicated and costly. But once you bought the truck, you don't care. I find this pair of acorn nuts to be pretty interesting. I mean, why not just plain nuts here? Why these fancy ones? Well, if you think about it, it makes sense. They hold on a big metal guard that protects the bottom end of the shock absorber in the remote reservoir from rock damage. But if you ever need to remove the shock absorber, well, you'll first have to remove this guard. And if the threads were exposed, they could get so bunged up that you couldn't remove the nut. So the acorn nuts protect the threads so that the nuts could be removed at any time. This is interesting. You've seen this little triangle shape that usually shows that's a place you can put a jack stand. And that's really nice because that is a place you can put a jack stand. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do because, you know, this truss work makes this anything but level. So they've created a little spot here to put a jack stand just like mine. And it's perfect. So now we're looking at the standard trailer hitch. And you can see that the cross tube is the home of these really big uh, recovery loops, which is great.
But what's really kind of neat is, you know, this flat section here, which is also accessible in the bumper cutout, is really a good place for a high lift jack. I mean, the Tacoma did something like that, but they kind of have them labeled as such. These don't seem to be labeled for that purpose, but they sure look fit for that purpose. Here's the Ranger Raptor's rear brake, and to no one's surprise, it's a single piston sliding caliper with the piston here and the sliders here, and it grasps the rotor here. It's a ventilated rotor, and uh, yeah, electric parking brake. That's something that it has as well. But yeah, pretty standard stuff. So these are the standard wheels and tires that come on the Ranger Raptor. BF Goodrich All-Terrain TA KO3s LT285 70R17, they're load range C. That makes them 33 inch tires, really nice size. These are the standard wheels. There's some beadlock capable ones for 1495 bucks but they're not bead lockers unless you buy the accessory bead lock from Ford Performance. I don't know how many people will, so this is probably the better bet because they're pretty nice looking wheels. And they're 17, so there's tons of sidewall when you're doing your off-road stuff. So I don't know what's wrong with just staying with these. All right, let's see what one of these things weighs. eighty three point eight pounds well that's about it for the suspension deep dive portion of this look at the new ranger raptor if you've seen one of these before you know what comes next you put the wheel and tire back on button it up and get ready to put it on the ramp tomorrow to see how well the suspension flexes and i'm not really sure what to expect on the one hand the front stabilizer bar even though it's direct acting isn't massive uh, but there's no disconnect like there is on a Bronco, at least at some levels you can get one. But there is no stabilizer bar here on the rear. I forgot to point that out, but uh, yeah, I'm pointing it out now. So yeah, there's a good chance it has some pretty decent articulation. Although the suspension travel numbers are good, but they're not as good as an F-150 Raptor or a Bronco Raptor, which have a couple of inches more front and rear. So yeah, we'll just have to see what happens. But however that works out, I've driven this thing off-road and I really like the way it hammers across the, 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 the countryside. It really feels good. The suspension is nicely tuned. Does it articulate as much as its competitors? I don't know, we'll find out. Well, one of the first things I've noticed is that these fender flares are probably bigger than they need to be. They're certainly bigger than I'd like them to be because I can't quite see the bottom of the tire as I'm lining up with the ramp. And uh, yeah, if they were a little bit more slender, it actually might emphasize the tires more. I don't know, would it be tougher that way or not? But certainly these aren't really helping visibility. Anyhow, what is pretty certain is there's a lot of clearance up here. Plenty of clearance uh, in front of the tire. Uh, the approach angle here is better than it is in an F-150 Raptor by a couple of degrees. And certainly no problem going up the ramp. I can't tell if that's it or not. I had the diff lock, so I might have driven too far. Yeah, I have. This is off the ground. I probably should have done it with the diff open just to give it a chance to spin and I could feel that. Still having a problem sighting the ramp here. Kind of veered a little bit further left than I'd like to. Again, I just don't have a line of sight to the tire so i'm going to back up a little bit unlock the diff and try that all over again for those of you thinking dan just use the cameras it's got a forward facing camera let me show you what you get with that 
So here's my ramp. Here's the garage door I don't want to hit. And here's another view from overhead. As you can see, I can see ahead of me, but I don't know where my tire is here or here. Really what this is good for is to make sure that, you know, if you're coming over a crest and another person's coming over the other way, you don't run into them. Or if there's big rock or the trail turns, you see that, but you don't get anything that can help you with tire placement. And that's really why I wish I could see better out the window. Because I want to see where my tire is relative to the peril on the trail. I'm going to lean a little further out and try to sight that tire. Oh, I can feel I'm too far there. Looks like I might have touched down. Well, the good news is, is even with the diff unlocked, the traction control just doesn't let this wheel spin freely. So you can make some progress and get over small interruptions in traction, which isn't a bad thing. It's just making it a little harder for me to feel when that lifts off here, which isn't really a problem out in the, the wilds. So I backed the truck down a little bit, just a little bit, and I think I found the sweet spot. So here's the sandpaper test. This is 150 grit, and it won't go under. Now I can just lift it up with a little pressure, and it goes under easily. Then I try to pull it out, and it moves around, but it doesn't want to come out unless I really, really yank on it. So right now, this tread is just barely touching the ground, and that's where I should measure. So now it's time to measure the height so I can determine the climb distance so I can calculate RTI. So I do that with the square, line it up with the middle of the hub, and thankfully Ford's logo here moves a little bit so I can square it up and use it as a nice reference and that is the spot right there so i'm going to mark that with tape and make a measurement so i measured 19 and a half there, but I really want this climb distance, but I can't measure it directly because this doesn't come to a point and I don't want to guess on where it might intersect the ground. So this is more foolproof in this case. Measure the height and divide by the sine of 20 degrees to get this length. Why the sine and why 20 degrees? Well, this angle is 20 degrees, my ramp angle. And of course the right triangle that represents the bottom and vertical legs here uh, means that you can apply sine when you're dealing with the length that is opposite the angle that you've chosen to look at, and cosine when you're dealing with the one that's close to the angle you're dealing with. So I like to think sine up, sine up, and cosine, cosine. So anyway, this height divided by the sine of 20 will give me the length along the hypotenuse that I really want. So what we've got here is 19.5, the measured height, divided by the sine of 20 degrees, and I get 57.01 as the climb distance. Now I know the wheelbase of this truck is 128.7, which is an inch or so shorter than the Tacoma, maybe even more than that. Uh, so that's an advantage for the Ranger. So I'm going to divide 57.01 by 128.7, the wheelbase, multiply that by a thousand to put it in the RTI format, and I get 443. Pretty much on the nose, no rounding really necessary there. So 443 is the RTI score, the flex index of the Ford Ranger Raptor. 
So what does all this mean for the Ranger Raptor? Well, as it so happens, there's a convenient space right here for its score. So we'll put it right in there, 443. Now, uh, you know, there's a lot of trucks on here, but many of these are last generation models. And, uh, you know, here's like a ZR2 from the last generation of 501, but the new one is only 461. So really, this is the current pairing that we should be looking at. And that's a less than 20 point difference. So not that much. Um, the Bronco, a regular Bronco with uh, 35 inch tires. This was the first edition. 463, only 20 points away, which is pretty good considering this wheelbase is considerably shorter than the Ranger Raptor. So I would expect a better score for a given amount of flex. And this indicates that maybe there's a little more flex here than there is here because this shouldn't be this close. But of course, you can push a button and disconnect this bar and go way up here, almost 100 points better. Sure would be nice if the Ranger Raptor have that, had that. I sure see room for it in the same place, and I got to think it would fit, uh, and it would, even if it doesn't do 100 points, it'd be nice if it did 50 or 60, it'd get it up here. Uh, with the, the leaders of the pack from last year in the midsize truck segment. So yeah, that's a what if, and maybe they'll do it. Maybe it doesn't pay off in this case. I don't know. Uh, but certainly, uh, we don't know what the new Tacoma TRD off-road is going to do. Uh, maybe it won't be as good as this. Certainly, uh, well, the TRD Pro, excuse me. Maybe the new TRD Pro won't be good as this. Maybe it backslides a little bit like the ZR2 did. So it might be tighter than it looks, but certainly this is a lot better than last generation Ford Ranger. And this was one with a factory lift kit, a Ford Performance two inch lift kit. And it was pretty bad. So I gotta say that whatever's going on with the competition, the Ranger has made big strides and the Ranger Raptor is in a decent place. Be nice if it's a little higher, disconnectable stabilizer bar might be just the trick. Anyway, that's what I found. Let me know what you think in the comments.